It's now been about one month since Apple's new M2 Pro and M2 Max MacBook Pros were announced, and as you probably already know, we went absolutely ham on the comparisons, with 14 videos jam-packed with a bunch of tests, and while we still have more to go, this review will basically wrap all of our findings so far into one easy-to-digest review, including what actually got a lot faster, what didn't, gaming performance, thermal throttling, SSD issues, Wi-Fi changes, and much more, as well as my recommendation for whether you should buy one of these or not, so let's get right into it. Of course, we know that the design and main feature set hasn't changed at all, with the exception of HDMI 2.1, which will really only matter for a small number of people. This update is all about the internal specs and changes, so if you care more about the design changes and user-facing features, features like a better display or anything like that, then you've got to wait until the next update, likely sometime in 2024. Now as far as the internal changes, we simply have upgraded M2 family chips that use more power and we have new wireless specs. The downside is that there are really no physical changes or upgrades in terms of the cooling system to compensate for the more power hungry chips. In fact, the heat sinks are now smaller this time around, which likely leads to slightly worse cooling performance. Apple did this because they rearranged their memory layout to use less physical space on the SOC package, as you can see in this image from iFixit, and they did that because there was an interposer supply chain shortage, which is the green material you see underneath the chips, which houses all of the fine intricate wiring between the chips and main logic board. And since the heatsink only needs to cover the actual chips, there's no reason to have a larger one, hence the small heat sink this year. And if you're wondering about how this impacts performance alongside the more power hungry chips, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. But first, I've got to mention the changes to the wireless specs. As for Wi-Fi 6E, Max tested this extensively in a video dedicated to this topic, which you can check out if you care enough, but the main point was that the new 6 GHz band was quite unreliable unless the router is nearby or in the same room. But thankfully, Apple actually upgraded the regular 5 GHz antennas on these new MacBook Pros, so the Wi-Fi performance gets a big upgrade even without Wi-Fi 6E, which is great to hear. Now, as far as the battery life, these models are actually quite a bit better, especially when doing very light tasks like web browsing. Now, nothing about the actual batteries have changed. They're still the same size as before. The better battery life comes from the two additional efficiency cores in the new M2 Pro and Max chips, which are now also faster than they were before. This means that the power-hungry performance cores don't need to be activated as often when doing light tasks, leading to power savings. However, if you're constantly putting a heavy load on these machines, the battery life will actually be worse, like Dave2D tested and showed off, of course because these chips are more power hungry due to the faster 3.5 GHz clock speed and the extra cores. Now before I get into something that Apple has never done before with their silicon, I've got to tell you guys about our partner Moff's brand new foldable 5-in-1 sit-and-stand laptop desk, the Moft Z. Not only is it super thin so it can easily fit into your bag or on your shelf, but it's the only stand that offers both a sit and stand posture in a one-piece design, being super quick and easy to set up, being perfect for the new MacBook Pros so you can stand up and use it comfortably. And then we can easily drop it down and set it up with different angles including 25, 35, 45, or even a 60 degree angle for iPads. And to complete the experience, Moft also has their Snap Phone Mount, which allows you to mount your iPhone right on the back of your MacBook and use it as a webcam with the new continuity camera feature, or even mount your iPhone on the side of your display 
for a multitasking setup. So go ahead and check out both the Moft Z and the Moft Snap phone mount using the links in the description below. Now the one brand new unique change this year is that the M2 Max 16 inch bottle can clock even higher while in high power mode, specifically up to 3.68 gigahertz, which led to a single core score of over 2,050 points and the Geekbench 5 benchmark, about 5% higher than the other models clocked at 3.5 gigahertz. Now usually this would mean that all of your single core tasks are significantly faster, like web browsing as shown with the speedometer web browsing benchmark, but nope, for some reason, we didn't really see much gains at all across multiple tests like our Figma web design test project provided to us by our partners 500 Designs based out of Los Angeles. Smoothness while zooming into the web pages was basically the same as well as the actual final export time not really being much different, so I'd say that 3.68 gigahertz clock speed doesn't really matter that much. Now what does matter is thermal throttling specifically with the 14 inch model, but before I get into that, I've got to mention the SSDs. Yes, the base 512 gig models of these laptops still have the same SSD NAND chip issue as we had with the M2 MacBook Air, where Apple has cut down the number of NAND chips, or basically raw storage chips, by half compared to the previous base models and compared to the new one terabyte SSD models. This leads to slower SSD transfer speeds as well as slower SSD swap performance, which is essentially the process of the system borrowing SSD storage to use as RAM memory in the event that the RAM starts getting full. Two times less SSD NAND chips means two times less lanes or bridges for that data to travel back and forth, which creates a traffic jam that slows down the system compared to the previous 512 gig SSD model, which had two times more chips or lanes, which could handle this SSD swap process better and faster. And to simulate this, we opened 15 Chrome tabs while also testing real world applications like exporting raw photos in Lightroom Classic. And we found that even though the new M2 Pro model is significantly significantly faster when nothing else is open in the background, it actually becomes slower than the previous model due to this SSD swap issue when you have tabs open. But don't worry, it's nowhere near as bad as it was on the M2 MacBook Air because one, these Pro models come with 16 gigs of base memory, so it's harder to hit the limit, and two, the actual SSD chips themselves are much faster on these ones than they are on the Air. So because of that, most tasks that we tested like programming and video editing didn't really see much of an impact. It was mostly just photo editing because it's extremely reliant on RAM. That's actually really good news, and we can safely give the okay to buy these 512 gig SSD base models for those who are really trying to save money, but only if the tasks that you're working with don't rely heavily on the RAM. Photo editors should absolutely get at least one terabyte of SSD in order to get the full amount of SSD NAND chips to solve this issue, and now let's finish off with the general performance. Yes, the new models are around 15 to 23% faster in terms of the CPU performance for things like programming, photo editing, CPU, rendering, or whatever else. And yes, the single core performance has improved by about 16%, leading to a snappier machine overall for common apps and web browsing, so that's definitely a nice boost. But as for the graphics, we compared similarly specced chip models going from the M1 Pro and M1 Max chip to the new M2 versions, and in the gaming benchmarks, we saw about 22 to 29% more performance. And I actually did a full gaming review video where I tested a bunch of games on the new 38 core M2 Max model, and the results were honestly not that great. And a lot of the non optimized Mac games like League of Legends and StarCraft 2, which are relying on Rosetta 2 translation, I only saw about 10 to 15 percent gains in FPS. The Windows game GTA 5 surprised me by being over 60% faster, but that may have been due to some optimizations that Crossover made over the past year and a half. 
But what really shocked me was the performance of World of Warcraft, which is fully optimized for metal and it saw huge gains. So for anyone playing that game or other metal optimized games like the new Resident Evil Village, it's definitely worth getting the new 38 core M2 Max. But for other things like video editing, I honestly wasn't that impressed. With very minimal gains for tasks that rely on the media engines, which means the H.264, H.265, and ProRes codecs. If you're like most people and you're editing using those codecs, do not bother upgrading. And even for unsupported codecs, it wasn't a huge difference anyway, like being just 15% faster for the 8K Red Raw export test. But where it really shined was Blender 3D rendering, where most tasks were 42 to 45% faster, and some even got close to twice as fast. And those were the best games we saw across the board, so 3D renderers rejoice. And to finish off with this review, the last thing I've got to mention is the 14-inch M2 Max model with the 38-core GPU. For some reason, Apple is choosing to clock the GPU on the 14-inch M2 Max model down even when it's not hitting its thermal limits. For example, the 16-inch model was 20% faster in a quick gaming benchmark test. And when pushing them to their limits with both a CPU and GPU stress test at the same time, the 16-inch model finished with a 2.5 times higher CPU score and a 9% higher GPU score. The reason for that was because the fans on the 14-inch literally can't handle the heat of both the CPU and GPU running under load at the same time which leads to a chassis temperature of around 52 degrees Celsius, which forces Apple to slow down the chip performance drastically. So if you care a ton about sustained performance under load and maximizing the performance of your machine, do not buy the 14-inch M2 Max model with the 38-core GPU. So now, with all those results out of the way, my recommendation is to honestly just wait another year and a half until the M3 Pro and Mac MacBook Pro models are here, or better yet, if you don't need a ton of performance, just wait for the new M3 MacBook Air coming likely in the fall, which will have brand new CPU and GPU cores on TSMC's 3 nanometer process. And if you absolutely must buy something right now, then go ahead, they're still great machines, but I wouldn't recommend going all out on the upgrades like the SSDs, since you might be tempted to buy one of the new M3 models when they eventually come out. So hopefully you enjoyed watching this review, and if you did, go ahead and click the circle above to subscribe for more videos like this one. Check out one of those two right over there, including the Wi-Fi 6 e-test video. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.